All right. Uh, Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, this is the What is an App and is it Right for Your Farm webinar um, it's hosted by Resources for Resilient Farmers, which is a project of the Farmers of Color Network supported through an FSA cooperative agreement. Um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Lisa Mish and I'm the Director for Farmer Outreach and Technical Assistance at RAFI USA. And from RAFI, we also have Nikki Presley and Sabine Fred Bernards, who are the Farmers of Color Network Program Coordinator and Grants Coordinator. And three of us are the technical assistance providers for the Resources for Resilient Farmers project. A couple housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, please stay on mute during the webinar. We'll have a couple of times for uh, Q&A. And at that point, if you want to ask a question, feel free to come up mute. Um, the webinar is being recorded and we'll share it with all uh, participants afterwards and it will also be on our YouTube channel. And uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. We won't come off mute and do um, um, introductions off mute, but if you want to see your name, where you're calling from, if you're a farmer, what you produce, or if you support farmers, um, what, kind, what kind of farmers do you work with? And feel free to add questions related to the presentation throughout. Um, the webinar and we can circle back to them during the, the Q&A portions. I first wanted to give a brief overview of the Resources for Resilient Farmers project. Um, as we know, there's many grants and programs and services available to farmers that can strengthen the viability of operations, um, but availab availability isn't always enough. Um, awareness and accessibility can be particular challenges for farmers who produce on a small scale our BIPOC, beginning or otherwise socially disadvantaged. So the project, Resource for Resilient Farms, Farmers focuses on outreach and technical assistance for USDA programs that can support greater farm resilience uh, for those within RAFI's Farmers of Color Network. Uh, but many of the resources that we develop um, will be ben benefit those um, that don't identify as farmers of color. Um, the, far, the flyer here shows some of the things that we're able to help farmers with, such as navigating which disaster relief programs might be um, applicable to their operations or getting a farm number. And you can email us, give us a call, or fill out an intake form if you would like further technical assistance on any of those bullet points. You can also visit our webpage for program specific um, flyers. And a quick overview of our agenda today. After a welcome, we'll go into an overview of NAP program, um, then have a shorter Q&A break if there's any particular questions about um, the NAP structure, and then go into some NAP farmer scenarios of how things can play out in real life um, dealing with NAP. And then we'll have a kind of longer extended Q&A to really get into some nitty gritty details if they come up, um, and then we'll wrap up. All right, next I'll introduce our guest presenter, um, James A. Davis III. James is originally from Scotland Neck, which is in Halifax County, North Carolina, and lives in Raleigh. He graduated from North Carolina A&T State University in 94, um, and then returned to Scotland Neck to support his family's farming business, which included cotton, peanuts, soybeans, corn, and Angus beef. In 2003, he took a position as the farm management specialist for Halifax County Extension, and then in 2007 became the Small Farms Assistant Director for North Carolina Department of Agriculture. 2010, he became the County Executive Director, Director for USDA's Farm Service Agency in Halifax County. And in 2016, moved to the State FSA Office to serve as the Agricultural Program Specialist for NAP, TAP, OCCSB, and Compliance Programs. Then in 2020, he was promoted to his current role as Price Support and Operations Program Chief, where he continues to be North Carolina's expert on NAP. At this point, I will turn it over to you, um, James, to give us an overview of, of NAP. All right, thank you, Lisa. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, good, great. Um, welcome everyone and good afternoon. As, as Lisa stated, yes, I am James Davis with USDA Farm Service Agency located here in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I currently serve as the NAP specialist. And basically today we want to give a brief overview over NAP um, and to answer any questions that anyone may have. I know we possibly may have some people that's out of town on the call that's not native to North, maybe native to North Carolina, but don't live in North Carolina. So a couple of things that I want to make a disclaimer on 
is when I get to in the slides, we're going to show a couple slides. One slide is going to show application closing dates. I want to make sure everyone on the call that's not from North Carolina understand that these dates are relative to North Carolina and not to your particular state. Um, also, it may get to a part where we talk about planting date for specific crops. I do want to make sure that those dates are only uh, specific to North Carolina. Um, we were, you, you know, get your back call, right? My bag got big call. Okay. Those, those dates um, that's not for a plan date would be specific to your state. So I do want to make that di disclaimer right now um, before we get to those slides. So I won't forget when we get there. Basically, it's what is an app? We look at an app, it's, it's a risk management tool designed to reduce financial losses. In a nutshell, I call it a safety net for producers well, the smaller, large producers for a variety of different crops. Um, it helps you cover that in case if you do have a loss. I always look at NAP as just like car insurance. You take it out, you may use it sometime, and you may not use it. But it's always, is always say, what is NAP? It's always this what if. What if a disaster happened? Or, or what if not necessarily a natural disaster, but if you have excessive moisture, or if you have excessive heat that causes drought, that could, talk, could possibly cause you some problems with your produce or whatever you're raising, your particular crops that you're raising. Number one, the two ways um, NAP looks at crops, we look at production on crops, and we also look at value loss crops. Value loss crops are covered under what we call, is like our Christmas trees or looking at covering our aquaculture or either our oysters, things of that measure or even floriculture and basically what value loss mean is the producer sets a value an inventory a value sets a value i'm sorry to the inventory that you have for any given year and that inventory and that value that inventory can be changed from year to year so depending on what that year you know if you have it you may reduce one year and you may not need specific coverage or value loss coverage on that crop so that can change that. But as far as production go, production never changes. Um, it's basically according to what your production records would be. Um, next slide. Okay, who is NAP for? NAP is for any producer that's growing, that has a risk in an agricultural commodity that you're growing for your any given state. Um, basically, the NAP coverage is take, taken out upon the number of shares that any producer has. Say, for instance, you may share 50-50 on a crop with somebody. So therefore, your shares on that crop will be 50-50. You could have three people on there. Each one of you, will, all the shares will be broken out upon what you all say the shares are. It doesn't, it's not determined by the farm service agency what your share would be. It is according to the share that you will report on your FSA 578. And we'll talk about that at a later time in the slides. Um, so any producers that's covering a different, a different, any commodity for you in a given state, and we'll talk about the list of different commodities that we have that, that is covered. And we'll talk about that again later on the slide. Next slide. What kind of NAP coverage is available? It's two types of NAP coverage that producers can take out. You have our basic coverage level. We also have our buy-up coverage level, which our basic coverage level is, and I think the next slide will talk about it, but we, we also talk about it now as well. Now, say for instance, you want basic coverage level. We have 50%, it's a 50 slash 55 coverage level, which basically that means we're gonna cover you at 50% of your yield at 55% of your market price which your yield will be determined by your production over a three to five year period. If you are a new and beginning producer, then you will be assigned what we call the assigned county yield, which we call our T yield. And that's the county established yield that the county has for that given crop. But it's also good to make sure you keep up with your production records even before you take out NAP. And if you have good production records, you could bring those records into the office and say, listen, this is what been my historical average over the years, and I would like to use these records for this program. And then you can do that. 
then you won't have to start out using the T-yield. Because traditionally, a T-yield is basically is the average yield of all producers, which may not may be lower or it may be higher than the yield that you determine to use. So therefore, if you have a lower yield, then the T-yield will be fine for you. You wouldn't have to use your yield. We would use the higher of the two. And at that 50, 55% level, basically, and we'll talk about this later when we get into some examples of what that 50 and 55 mean. The other coverage level that you can cover is called buy-up. And that's when we're going to basically, you're going to talk about different situations where you can go up from anywhere from a 50, 100 to a 65, 100 level which basically means at those levels, always remember the, the number on the left side is always talking about the yield. The number on the right is talking about the price. So for, so for buy-up coverage, you're going to always get guaranteed 100% of the market price, which market price is not the price that is established by you. That's the market price that's established by your local, by your state office in your particular state for that given crop. And basically what the state committee does they look at what the NAP specialist for that state presents to them on the data that they covered, they found for that any given crop and establish the, the price for that. And basically at 5,100 level, we, they're gonna cover 50% of your established yield at 100% of your price. And it can go all the way up to 65% of your yield at 100% of your market price. Buy-up coverage will, We'll talk about a little later, we'll incur a premium, which the basic coverage level doesn't cover a premium. And basically what the basic coverage level is, number one, if you are a social disadvantaged, limited resource farmer, your basic coverage level, your application fee for NAP is free. And I think we'll talk about that a little later and I'll go in more detail about that. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, okay, well, that's fine. How do you apply for that? We'll talk about that now. How do you apply for that? Number one, let me talk about farm numbers. Every producer that comes into the farm service agency, you need to have an established farm number. We can get farm, we can get established farm and track numbers for any given producer, whether you own the land or rent the land. You just have to come into one of your local offices and discuss and talk to them about the land that you're going to be wanting to get coverage on. It could be that the land that you cover could have previous history and already have a farm number, whether you own or rent the land. But if you own the land, one of the requirements is that you want to do it. You bring a copy of your deed or whatever that you have to show that you are the owner. They can go in and actually draw you a farm map and give you a farm and track number. And that way, that's one of the first key things to go into and start doing. Even backing up before then, if you've never been into a local FSA office and you want to find out the offices and contact information for your area, you can visit farmers.gov. And then you can go in and find out if any information for your given state and also get state office information and also get county office listed for the counties that you can contact for your local office. From there, once you get that farm number established, any local office will tell you how to do that. Um, if you're in North Carolina, if you call the office and, and someone tell you that you can't do it, I please would like to know about that if they tell you that you can't get a farm number on your land. So I would like to definitely know about that. But every local office in any state can tell you how to get a farm number. From that, once you get your farm number established, what you're gonna do, they're going to give you a map to go along with your farm. It's going to, therefore, your map is going to dictate the land and the number of acres that you have. Therefore, when you get whatever you're planning to grow on that map, you're going to notate it on the map and give that acreage for that any given commodity that you're going to have. One thing about that farm number, then, what that leads to is what we call a FSA 578, which is our acres report. That's an acreage report that every farmer will give, no matter what crop that you raise, whether you're going to take out NAP insurance or rail crop insurance, that 578 has to be made. And every producer has to, once they report that given crop and acreage on that 578, 
every producer have to sign off on that to say, okay, these are the acres that I have. Then after that, then you can talk about any local office will tell you about NAP coverage, see that, see whether or not the crop that you want to try to grow in your area is available for NAP coverage. They will be able to let you know for that. They will be able to let you know also whether or not it's available for NAP or if regular crop insurance is offered on that. Bear in mind, if regular crop insurance is offered on that crop, then you can't take out NAP. NAP is, is really used for crops that are not, that regular crop insurance doesn't cover. So therefore, the next step then after that, the acreage report is done. Then if you want to take out NAP, you're gonna do a NAP application for coverage, which is on a form CCC 471 that you see on the screen. Also, to go along with the application of coverage, they will let you know then what are your application closing dates are. For North Carolina, most of our closing dates, most of our crops closing date is February 28th or any given year. And so the deadline is nearing on a lot of crops for North Carolina. Some crops have been January 1 of that year has been the deadline. But every local office will be able to let you know what crop deadlines are for any given crop. Also to make sure when you go in and you're talking about NAP, make sure every county office give you NAP basic provisions. What those basic provisions is basically, it's like a five or six page book. I ain't gonna say a book, but a handout that they give you that details NAP in general. It talks about NAP, the application um, fees. Uh, it talks about the premium fees. It talks about everything in those basic provisions and make sure every county office give you that. Therefore, that can be your guideline for NAP throughout that whole year. Also, never forget to ask for a receipt for service. Whether or not you take out NAP or you get a farm number, anything that you request of that local farm service agency office, ask for that receipt for service. Basically, that would give you an outline of what you talked about when you went to that office on any given day. I know offices now are we're not, I know like for North Carolina, we're still back down at a 25% restriction level because of COVID. And basically what that means is we only align 25% of the staffing in office now. Um, and also we're not allowing any visitors to come into the office, but we are accepting phone calls. We are getting people on email lists, letting them know of everything that needs to go on. Next slide. And let me actually skip back to those two farmer examples because I breezed past those okay. slides and I think those are useful uh, to All right. go over. All right. Okay. Back looking at those examples, when we're talking about basic coverage level, and, and, and based on what these examples say, like I said, we're looking at for basic coverage level, we're looking at 50% of the yield at 55% of the price. So basically, you're looking at 100 bushels of squash. Number one, the squash, that means your, your average production history was 50, 100 bushels to the acre of squash. So basically, with insurance on that at the 50% level, we're going to cover you at, at, at the 50% at the 50 bushel level, which basically means any time, if you had a total, total loss on that 100 bushels, we're going to cover 50, 50 bushels of that, because that's what your guarantee would be. But say for instance, if you don't make but 30 bushels, then therefore we're gonna cover the 20 up to the 50. So that's how the 50% of the yield work. Now, at 55% of the price being basically, say for instance is, if the price was a dollar a bushel, we're just using this for example, then therefore at that dollar per bushel, we're gonna cover 55 cent of that dollar which is 55% of that dollar, and we'll cover 55% of that on that. Now, if we talk about buy-up level, if we use that same example, if we use that same example and let's just look at it, for instance, for 5,100 level, that means we're gonna cover 50 bushels, we're gonna co still cover the same 50 bushels of the yield, but we'll cover 100% of the price, so we'll cover that whole dollar. But if we go up to the highest buy-up level, which is the 65,100, that means we're gonna cover 65 bushels. It's still at 100 
as 100% of that market price, which would be that whole dollar. So that's how the difference between basic and the buyer goes. Premium service fees and discounts. Like I said initially, all service fees per crop is $325, $325 per crop. But as you can see that the service fee is way for beginning, social disadvantaged, veteran, or limited research farm. So basically that means to apply for coverage, don't care on how many crops you want to have covered. If you fall into that class, your application coverage fee is gonna be free. You will be guaranteed free coverage on that 50 at 50, 55 level. So at that basic coverage level, it will cost you nothing to have that coverage. So to me, I always tell people, or whatever I do mean, if you fall into that class, you're crazy to go in to not to take coverage out. Number one, the other advantage of you taking coverage out, that helps you keep up with production records, production history, even if you don't necessarily never would take out buy-up level, at least would, a, would keep a, a production history. So whenever you decide that you want to go there, we got, a, we got um, records on file for your production history, and also you have it as well. So therefore, please look into that. Now, on the buy-up level coverage, basically what we're going to do is you still going to have that application coverage fee is for free on that but you will incur a premium, which the premium is based on 5.25% coverage of all your producers' acreage. Basically, you see down there an example with how the, cover, how the premium is calculated. And we won't go into details and show the premium, but any given local office, they have what we call a premium, estimated premium calculator in those local offices. And if you all go in and say, say, man, I want to do five acres of strawberries and I would like to look at it, taking it out at the 50, 100 level, even the 65, 100 level. And they can go in and give you an estimate of your premium. So that's why I won't go into detail on that because that's going to be producer specific. But basically what that's going to do is basically any premium for any producer, even if you didn't fall in this class, will never go over $15,700. But always know that at the buyout level you fall in that class, your premium is 50%. So always know for your premium will never go over 7,000, I think 200, I can't know the exact figure, but never go over, say for instance, over $7,500. So therefore your premium will always be in hand. But always know that premium is gonna be based upon the number of acres that you plant. And then again, our software pulls from that five, seven to eight acres report that I talk about and all of that works together when it pulls in to get that fee established. Next slide. Okay, on this particular slide, this is what I, I talk about. Every year I have to, I have to step establish yield and prices for all these crops that you see on this list um, for North Carolina. And you see where the application closing date is on these crops. For say for instance, like let's look at for like blueberries. If a person had blueberries and they wanted coverage for the 2022 crop year, they would have had to go into the local office and apply for coverage before November 20th, 2021. Those are just one of the type of crops that have to be, the application of coverage have to be applied for in the previous year for the next year. Strawberries is one of our biggest crops in North Carolina that a lot of people come in and do. And then you'll see for strawberries, the application closing date on that is September 1st of that previous year. So basically what this does, every county office, I give a county office a copy of this every year that they know it when the application dates change. Um, I provide every county office a copy of this. They all have that on hand. Um, when you go into a local office in North Carolina, they will be able to hand you one of these if you want one. That gives you all the local, the dates of different crops that's on there that we have on what we call our national crop table. And it lets you know all of the application closing dates 
that you can take out coverage prior to getting it. Now, say for instance, if, you, if, if, if someone in North Carolina, if you want to take a crop out, let's say for instance, um, trying to find a crop here that it might have been January 1. Say for instance, the lettuce. If you may grow lettuce, the application closing date for lettuce was January 1, which that means the date has passed. We do have provisions, what we call a late file application for coverage, which has to go to Washington for approval. That's something that won't be approved on the local level. In any state that you're in, once a late file application is filed, if it goes after 30 days, once it reached that 31st day after that application closing period, it has to go up to Washington to get approval. So bear in mind and keep that in mind when you apply that all of these dates, you can't apply after that date. You can't apply, say for instance, if you apply for letters on January the 6th, even though it is late, the local county committee has up to that 30, to 30 days after the application closing date to approve it. Once it hits that 31st day, is no exception. It has to come up to me really on the state level, come up to me and I have to present it to the national office for approval. So bear in mind when you look at these application closing dates, they establish these dates for a reason because between these dates, the final, the normal harvesting date, the final planting date, all of those dates coincide with each other for timeliness of the crop. And that's why application closing dates are set. Next slide. You had a crop law, now how do you receive NAP assistance? If you were a producer, Say for instance, if you did, we go back to the lettuce since I've been talking with lettuce. Say for instance, if you had a loss on lettuce, the first step that you need to do, if you think, say for instance, as soon as that you think a loss is apparent, you need to notify that office within 72 hours that that loss was apparent. Bear that in mind, 72 hours. Basically mean within three days that that loss was apparent. You need to let that office know, say, listen, my lettuce, we had some severe weather in my area and it downpoured and my lettuce was uh, uh, was flooded and I think it is dying and drying in the field, dying in the field, flooded out, lose it. Therefore, you contact your local FS office and say, look, I'm letting you know that we received X amount of rain on blah, blah, this day, blah, blah, that day. And I think I'm gonna have a law. Could you please send one out to look at this? What they're gonna do, once you notify the local office, we have what we call NAP loss adjusters. Every state has their different loss adjusters, which are basically contract workers that have been trained to do adjusting. Um, so therefore, um, they can go out, we'll notify the loss adjusters, they will come out, look at the crop, and from there do an assessment. From there, if your eligible loss, once he report back to the local office, the county committee will look at everything and to see whether or not everything is important to make your notice of loss eligible. And from there, we will receive, if you were able to, to get any, you know, any production or whether you didn't have any production. If you had production, at that point, you have to provide production records to the local office of production you did have. If you didn't have no production, you let the loss adjuster know in the field that no, I did, I wasn't able to harvest anything. Because what they're gonna do when they first come out, they're gonna do an initial inspection. And what they're gonna do, the loss adjuster is gonna let you know that, well, look, whether or not they see, well, look, it's still some potential there. I have noticed it and I have notated it in my loss adjuster notes that you will carry this on to harvest. Now, if you still don't harvest nothing after that, just call us back and report, said, no, I didn't harvest anything, or I did harvest something, then provide the record. The loss adjuster will come out and what we do, what we call a final inspection. And then from there, after the final inspection is, inspection is done, and he turned in his final paperwork, then the local officer will compute whether or not 
the loss generated a payment or it didn't generate a payment. Basically, payments will be generated based upon what your production history had been, you know, what it was calculated to be, and your loss came up only what your um, um, approved yield is, then it'll generate a payment. Next slide. Okay, I think that is our, our first section, kind of the general overview. Um, Sabine, is any, any questions coming in the chat? Yeah, um, Ray asked something about the closing dates. When are those made public? So when would we find out the strawberry closing date for 2023 coverage? Um, how do people find those things out? You have to go to your local office to receive that. Those dates are, made, are not made public um, for the general public. They're made because those dates have to be approved by the state committee. Then the dates are approved at a certain point in the year. So at any given time, most of the time, most local offices will have those dates on hand for any previous year. And let me say that, for most dates, even if the new dates are not in, say for instance, if you go in an office on August of that previous year, say for instance, if you go in there and looking at stuff in the fall of year for 2023. If you go into the local office, number one, for the most part on that sheet, the only thing changes on that sheet from year to year is the year. Those dates don't never change. I can't say that for North Carolina, those particular dates probably haven't changed. I've been in NAP special since 2016, and I know for a fact most of those dates have never been changed. Um, on there, but the local county, every local county office in your state can give you what those dates are. If you contact that local office, they can give you those dates, those application closing dates. Got it. So they're not made public necessarily, but you need to go into the FSA office and they can- That's give right, them. and they can give to the public. It's not It's not a site that we have that we, um, that's not you know, generated to the public. And I know, I guess that a question that I can pose. It never had been public when I took over the position in 2016, and I don't necessarily know the reason why it hasn't, but I know it's something that, that they have never did before in the past, but I can inquire about that and hopefully get a question answer back on that. But every local office will have those. No matter what state you're in, every local office will have it. State office as well, because the NAP specialist is the one that had to give them to the local office as well. Um, thank you. Uh, the next question that came in through the chat is someone asking about production records on forages, so pastures for grazing. Um, how do they calculate those? Well, as far as you 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 cutting of hay and different things, basically you taking your production records in on on what your, your hay production will be every. Everything we don't have a tremendous life of hay and forage in North Carolina in our western part of the state. We do have some that take out coverage on that, but for the most part, it's treated just like a commodity. You're gonna provide different records of your cutting for the different types of hay that you have. You're gonna provide that those production records for that, whether whether you put it in bales or however you keep up with it. You're gonna pro provide that production as well for that. Got it. Um, are there any other questions that people want to chime in with? Otherwise, we have some kind of, um, we have a little more presentation or we have some other um, general questions we can put in. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about how people decide if they should apply for buy-up coverage or basic coverage. I think that's something that um, maybe someone who's been farming for a few years, how do they decide which one makes more sense for them? That's a, that's a, that's a great question. I, I recommend anybody just starting off, if you knew, to really get your feet wet in the program. Number one, the way NAP is set up, it won't allow for a person coming in their first year to even take out buy coverage. They want a person to come in and get established with NAP before we even let them take out buy coverage. So therefore, the agency doesn't want anybody to incur a premium 
on a program, on a product that they really not experienced with the program that much. So therefore, for your first year as a beginning or a new producer, they're not going to let you, you're not able to take out valid coverage level. So therefore, that first year, you're going to be obligated to take out basic coverage level. And from that, once you get that first year behind your back, you'll kind of see whether or not is this product good for me or not. Is you know, every, every producer is going to be specific to their operation. I'm a past farmer that used to farm almost 10 years full time, and every farmer scenario is going to be different. Um, I, I traditionally did row crop farming where I did regular, a lot of regular crop insurance, but I used different products specific to the crops that I was doing. So therefore, it's going to be very specific to now. It may be a situation where a producer look at it and say, well, I'm, I normally don't have, you know, much loss. Um, I don't know if it's going to be benefit for me or not to take it. But as I said in the beginning, if for your first year starting out, I mean, for any time, you're crazy not to take it when it's free. The only decision that you really need to make is what it comes to is whether or not you're going to want to invest in buy up or not. And you can look at your number of acres. I always will look at the number of acres I say have and see whether or not what my bottom line is is what I want to make at the end of the year off of that. And to see whether or not once the, you go into that local office and then they run that estimated calculated premium for you, then you can kind of send yourself, now, is it worth me now? My premium might be $2,000 a year. Well, I ain't been making but $1,500 a year off my product. You know what I'm saying? So therefore, it's kind of those things, and it's going to be producer specific. That's what I'll just leave it at that. Every scenario is going to be different. And I think you need to really go into the local office and, and do a scenario on the number of acres that you're talking about doing and let them try to give you that estimated premium. And then that account decide whether or not you take that premium out or not. Thank you. Um... Next question someone had is about how many, what percentage of farmers in North Carolina or maybe in, in general um, who take out app insurance actually end up getting paid for disasters um, if they do report? And similarly, maybe if you can answer also what the process is for if someone files and they, um, they're they denied, is there any sort of um, like a, appeals process? Okay. Um, the first, the, the, um, for the first course question, it was a, um, Repeat the first part, first part of the question again. Yeah, sorry, I shouldn't have grouped those in. Um, what percentage of farmers take out who take out NAP insurance actually end up getting paid for a disaster when they re when they report a loss? Okay, um, I really don't have those numbers on what percentage that they get paid. I guess it just ultimately it depends on what that producer's established APH is. If they are a if they are a new producer and starting from scratch, say for instance, a bunch of two two to three years, that percentage probably will be high that they won't receive anything, because the higher your APH is, the better your guarantee gonna be. So therefore, when if the county yield, for example, say for instance on the crop, if the county yield was thirty, and you've been used to doing fifty, so what you basically want to do is getting in production history for the next five years, your record. So then therefore, when you have a loss, it's based upon your 50 and not based upon that T year. Because what happens each year, that T year is figured in each year till you reach that five year threshold. So therefore, that's how your yield gonna be established is based upon your average year history. So the more history that you have of your established year, the better off that you're going to get a payment because that T year may be so low, even on a disaster year, you still might could make, you know, the T year. You still, unless you have a total wiped out disaster, and you don't have anything. But for the most part, you got to understand when you're dealing with most of that was covering a lot of produce crops. These are high yielding crops, whether they're okra, squash, People are, these crops are producing heavily every day. So you're getting a lot of production. So therefore, sometimes you may start halfway the season 
and you might have had a high yield. Then you come up and had a disaster come out and wipe everything. But that high yield is still that it you did have is averaging with what you didn't have. So it's kind of, you know, I look at it when I farm, honestly, I took out now, I took out insurance because number one, I borrowed money to farm. It was a requirement me for me to have insurance. So I had to have it. And that's why I took out insurance. But if you're a person that you're bankrolling your own self and if you have your own money to do it, then you got to think for yourself then, is it worth for me to have a safety net on my own money and on their own return on my investment? So I think to having some return is better than having no return on your investment. So to me, again, I go back, keep talking about the basic cover level. Yeah, you, you're good to have it. But scenario wise, it's, it's going to be specific, producer specific to make sure you run those estimated calculated premium reports on what you want to do to kind of see whether or not it's going to be worth your while. Because every crop is high yielding. You say, for instance, for example, I give you like strawberry. Strawberry is a high yielding crop. You got some producers yielding $5,000 an acre on strawberry. So therefore, most producers that's growing nap, I know a bunch that don't take out nap cover. But if they in business and they're doing good business and they making money on strawberry, they gonna have nap cover and they gonna take buy out on it to cover it. Because it's so high, it's number one, most of your um, strawberries is on black plastic. So therefore, that means you're getting the necessary water that you're getting. It's going to be high yielding. Most of the time, whether it's a pick your own or a set price, you're going to get do pretty good off of it. Unless you have a real bad hailstorm come through or real bad hard freeze or something with wet weather or whatever to do that loss, a lot of people are going to take out nap cover. It just depends on the crop you have and, and the, the market that you have for that crop and you want to cover your market that you have. And what was the, what was the second part was about to make a not eligible and what happened if you get denied? Yeah, just is there a process for if you submit a claim um, and you're denied, is there an appeals process or how would that work? Yes, there, there is an appeal process. For most, for most situations, Excuse me. If you if you have an eligible disaster, say for instance, you call the local office. You say, "Listen, all nap has to be from a weather related event. Whether it's excessive rain, we had excessive excessive heat that caused the crop not to grow. So therefore, if you call to the local office, you say, "Listen, we had excessive rain out here." Um, could you send somebody out and look at what we have? All right, the loss of justice is going to go out and the loss of justice is going to report what he see. Now, the loss of justice, when he come out, he's just not going to be looking to see if it's wet around. They're going to be paying attention to if other farms in the area, the similar situation. They're also going to be looking at your management practices. Was it a lot of weeds out there? Was it a lot of grass out there? Was it maintained properly? They're going to look at all good farming practices on that. And what they're going to do when they write up their loss of justice statements in the field, what they're going to do, once they write them up, they're going to let you look at them. And then they're going to let you sign off on those statements that this is what I'm writing up in the field. And do you agree with this? If this is what I'm looking at. Okay, so therefore, if you sign off on it, they're going to bring it back to the office. What they're going to do is they're going to give it to their what we call them the NAP PT, which is the NAP program technician that's in that local office. What they're going to do is take that information to the county committee, which the county committee is made up of farmers in your local county, peers of your, your group or your farmer group that's familiar with different aspects of that county. They're familiar with, oh, yeah, they might send a meeting where then when you present this, yeah, it did have a storm in that area. It was excessive rain. Okay, that's fine. We know that the excessive rain was an eligible disaster. So that's not in question. Say, for instance, they go up and say, well, then they get to looking at it and they say, well, 
you look like they, they didn't perform best uh, management practices, they didn't care for the crop, then they may come back and ask the producer to provide evidence that you did, you know, what was your management practice? What did you do to keep weeds out? So if you was growing organic, you said, well, these are organic strawberries and you took out organic strawberries or whatever on the crop, on the list, then therefore then we know certain things you couldn't spray on. So tell me what did you do? But then if it's conventional, then they may ask you, well, what type of weed management system did you use? What did you spray out there? So best managed good farming practices could make that be ineligible. What happened if it's ineligible, then you can appeal that decision to your local county committee. They have to give you every county office when they deny a situation, they have to give you your appeal right. Therefore, it's spelled out in your appeal right. You can either appeal back to the county committee, you could appeal to the state committee, or you can appeal to NAD, which is a national appeal division. Most people are gonna start off appealing back to their county committee. So therefore the county committee, you go into the local county committee meet, you explain, they may ask you the question, well, the law suggests to say it, blah, blah, this, blah, blah, that. Explain to me, is this true or not true? Explain to me that what did, why did this take place? So then you explain to them, in a lot of situations, old county committee say, okay, we're gonna make it eligible. In some cases, they're gonna say, no, we upholding this ruling. So therefore, they're gonna give you your appeal rights again. Your appeal rights then, they're gonna say, okay, you can appeal to the state committee, or you can either appeal to NAD, the National Appeals Division. So, so what happens when you appeal to the state committee is, what happens, you will send up that appeal gonna come to your local state office. Most of the time it's gonna come to the NAP special. I get all the appeals come to me in the process. What I do with the appeal is I contact the producer, let the producer know that we did receive your appeal and I will be establishing a meeting time that you can meet to the local state, to the state committee. And then you can break down and prove your case and say why the county committee disapproved you or why they, why they shouldn't have disapproved you. And then from there for it'll go from there. I deal with appeal cases all the time that have gone all the way to the National Appeal Division. And that's no more than what we have to do then is taking it before administrative judge and both parties, which I'm the agency representative because I am the NAP special for the state. The agency representative and the appellant, which would be the producer. Then the appellant got to prove to the administrative judge what's going on. I got to, to present what the agency saw in reason why they denied it. So it is an appeal process. A lot of appeals are won, a lot of appeals are lost. It go hand in hand, really. Okay, I think we're gonna move on. We'll have more um, opportunities for questions and answers. So if any others come up while we keep going, please add them to the chat and we'll circle back. Okay. Uh, so now we're gonna go through a few um, NAP scenarios that some farmers might might encounter. Um, uh, we can go to the, we'll actually skip the first one because you kind of answered it already. Then okay. we'll jump to the second one. So farmer Jess knows her production's history um, that she averages around 40,000 pounds of watermelon per acre. She sells them at a farmer's market for a dollar per pound. She wants to buy, or she wants to get NAP buy-up coverage at the 65,100 level. But after reviewing Jess's production history, her FSA agent prepares a policy that covers 232 hundredweight per acre for $16.80 per hundredweight. Um, how does the FSA ag agent determine these numbers and how do they relate to Jess's operation? Okay, the, the, the FSA representative, FSA, FSA office is gonna always take the information that the producer gives them. If the producer hasn't enough an established production history, like say for instance, if the producer, if Jess had three years of production record, we're going to average those three, those three years with two years of the two year. That's going to come up and determine that producers, what they call actual production history. When we say APH, it stands for actual production history. So that's going to determine the producer's production history. Now, say for instance, if Jess has been farming over five years and she's on her seventh year, 
So all of her years are figured to any production history. It has nothing to do with county years. It's according to all to her production record. So then what happens on that then over the years, whether or not if she had any losses before or continued success in production, all her years gonna be established. She gonna have her own established year. And therefore her year will never have no resemblance of the T year. Unless her history of her years is below the T year, then we will substitute the T year for that producer. Now we won't, the producer will never have a year where she will all, they will ever, ever fall below the T year. We will always substitute that year. But we go always, if her yield is higher, then that's the year we're going to be looking at. Now, as far as the market price go on that, regardless of what that particular individual producer may be receiving for their watermelons or their crop, it has no bearing on the pricing for that crop because those prices are set, are set by the NAP specialist and approved by the state committee. So every year, that process of getting the market price, what I have to do every year, which is a long tedious process, is I have to go through whether I'm looking at national, national agriculture statistics data, whether I'm looking at agricultural marketing service prices, whether I'm looking at um, uh, extension materials, I have to look at data to establish the yield and prices for established T yield and pricing for individual crops. So therefore, the production history of producer has control over by establishing their records, but they have no control on that market price because that price is set at a state level. So therefore, every producer across will be afforded the opportunity for the same price but every producer won't have the same yield because the yield is based upon their individual records. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the next scenario um, is more for organic producers. Um, right. We have uh, Farmer Jonah, who's a certified organic producer. He wants to get um, NAP coverage for his lettuce crop, but because of his production methods, um, his average yield and average market price um, is much different than conventional growers in this area. Is there, any is there any difference in NAP coverage for organic producers specifically? Yes, it is. Every price on the national crop table is for conventional prices, but there are um, specifications for organic producers. And what the state committee agreed upon is for any farmer that when they report on that 578 for organic, and this is just for North Carolina, and the rule that North Carolina State Committee establishes, what we're gonna do is, we look at that price, that average market price, we gonna, the average market price is gonna be 145% of the market price. What we're gonna look at is, cause traditionally from statistics and data from universities in which we use a lot of that from is, Normally, organic yields are a little bit lower than what conventional yields would be. So therefore, they went with a rate of, we're going to use 65% of that producer's established yield as far as, as, far as an organic factor when we're doing the, doing the, doing the um, calculations for that producer. So we're going to use those particular factors. We're going to use a 65% yield factor at 105%, 45% of the price. So there are specifications for organics for different crops. Now, bear in mind, every state doesn't mean every crop will have a set organic price. North Carolina, we have different crops that are set for organic yields and specifications. Now, certain counties throughout the state, say for instance, like I had a lot of mountain counties where they solicited data where they had a lot of organic producers. So what they did was send in information and we had to get it approved by the national office that we had to set and turn these crops over and say, it's enough data to say we can apply those organic factors to it. So not every crop you're gonna see in North Carolina is gonna have an organic factor related to them, but Again, it goes back to how important it is to build a relationship with your county office. Every county office can tell you which crops have that factor on it, 
if you go in the local office and say, Vincent, well, I grow organic squash, does it have an organic factor to it? They can look in the system and they can tell you that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, next scenario is um, dealing with prevented planting. Um, Farmer Jeff signs up for NAP basic coverage for his summer squash in 2022. He has spoken with his FSA agent about NAP and knows he has to submit um, his acreage report and report that his summer got squash crop planted is, pl is planted by the county deadline of May 15th. However, a very wet May has led to unexpected delays in planting and Jeff um, isn't sure he can get the squash in the ground by May 15th. What should he do to still get NAP coverage? Okay. Uh, in this situation, as I talked about before, the application closing date and preventive planning is, is totally is two different things. You're gonna you're gonna be you're gonna have the coverage based upon when you apply first when you do on that CCC 470 fund 471 application of coverage. You're gonna have the coverage on that crop. Now the different planning dates that I talked about before, planning dates are specific to crops. Every crop is going to have different planting dates. Therefore, say for instance, if an average planting date, let you say here, was May 15 on that particular crop, some crops could be May 30. That is something that the local office can tell you regarding those crops, what the um, final planting date is to get that crop in the ground. Say for instance, if the final planting date was May 15, and you had planted about half of your crop, and you see coming up, you have a, say for instance, like week, week or two weeks before that May 15th date, you come in and had a real bad wet spell or a real bad dry spell. Say for instance, well, it's been too wet, I can't get in there to plant. So what you do in a situation like this, you go ahead on the call to the local office and say, look, I know I got nap coverage on my squash and I'm trying to get all of them planted in time, but there is no reason, no way that I'm going to be able to get out there and finish before May 15th. Say, for instance, this on May 10th. So therefore, you look, you let the local office know what they're going to do is a representative from the local office or either a loss adjuster will come out to your farm. And what they're going to do is verify the wet conditions. So therefore, they'll be able to apply certain factors to help you in that preventive planning instance. So therefore, if you had to go over that May 15th date, there will be some provisions to help you. What's that up, you Jeff? Jeff, I'm down the primer. <laughs> to help you, um, to help you fall in compliance, that preventive planning will help you meet those final plan dates that you need to do. So anytime it's up to you as a producer, if you ever feel time that you say, for instance, if it's, it's just been too dry, you don't feel comfortable about putting that plant in the ground or putting that seed in the ground because you know it's not going to germinate because of excessive heat and drought. Call the local office and listen. I think, I don't know, I've been trying to wait on the rain before I put it in the ground because I know it's gonna, not going to germinate. What do I need to do? Do I need to get preventive planting on this? And again, a person from the local office will come out there and look. And they need to look and verify it so you can get preventive planning provisions. So it is things in place to help a producer with that. Great. Uh, this next narrative is with unfamiliar commodities. Um, Farmer May grows a niche uh, vegetable, African eggplant, for a mm -hmm. small grocery store for small grocery stores in her area. Um, she goes to her local FSA office to discuss to discuss SNAP coverage. Um, however, the FSA agent tells her that the county office doesn't have African eggplant on their list of NAP eligible commodities and says they can't give her coverage. Is there any way for Farmer May to get coverage for her crop? Yes, what, what we, any time if, if a crop, say for instance, North Carolina is have unique crop just as well. South Carolina may grow a different variety of a sweet potato that North Carolina may not grow. So therefore, that particular variety may not be on what we call our crop table. So what we do in an instance like that, if a producer grew a crop, and say for instance, if it was grown in a adjoining state, or regardless, what we can do is solicit to the national office to have that crop added on their crop table for our state to give that producer coverage. Now, 
bear in mind with this is a lot of times this request is not a quick turnaround. What I suggest with any producer that has a crop that they've been growing, make sure they provide that local offer with some history of that crop. Make sure you tell them, well, listen, these are the planting dates when I've been planting this crop. This is the date when I normally harvest this crop. Um, I have been averaging X amount of yield per year on this crop. And this is what the type of pricing I've been getting. Because when you introduce a new crop that's new to a state, that basically means that nowhere in the state is no history on it. Even universities may not have history on it. So therefore, for even the state committee to recommend that approval to the national office, they're going to want to see some information on it to see if it's feasible for growing in that area. And every county committee, first of all, it has to meet the approval of the county committee to say whether or not, well, if it's conducive to grow in that county. So therefore, that's why you need to provide as much information to that local office you can. Provide pictures of it. Um, provide the dates, the, the dates, the yield, the pricing on it. So they can say, okay, well, then that'll work. So therefore, then this may work for other producers as well. So let us submit the paperwork we need to do to get this approved. But on top of that, that you don't see here on the slide too, that I that I forgot to mention, is for this. Say for instance. We have a crop, but stuff is we may not have African eggplant, but we have a type of eggplant. What I always recommend county office to do, if you have not that specific, we can offer you that other variety of eggplant so you can have some coverage on it. So you won't have no coverage for that year. You may not have that specific eggplant, but you have that type of eggplant. So I always have county office recommend that to producers and let them make the choice do they want to just use that variety versus using that African eggplant. So that is an option also. Uh, these last two scenarios deal with um, <clears throat> triggering a payment after an event. Um, mm -hmm. Farmer Steve has applied, has applied for a basic NAP coverage for 15 acres of sweet potatoes. In July, there was, a, there was massive flooding across five acres. He immediately filed notice of loss and met with the loss adjuster. But then he was notified that the damage did not qualify for a NAP payment. Steve is frustrated because in those five acres, there was 100% crop loss. So two questions, why might, why might farmer Steve not be eligible for a payment? And what might be a scenario when the loss adjuster would approve a NAP payment for farmer Steve? Okay. Well, first, let me, let me say this, and I, I don't know how I missed this before, but let us look at that. Loss adjusters never approve a NAP payment for a producer. Let me go ahead on and say that. The county committee either approves or disapproves any notice of losses and application for payment. Loss adjusters have no bearing in the disapproval or approval. They only report the facts and findings that they find in the field. Now, if it was a flooding area in that area, number one, that producer has an eligible cause of loss. Now, what could determine his age loss is when the loss adjuster went out there, even though he may have had flooded during that time, say for instance, if it was early on the crop, had been in the ground two weeks, and you see that it had come out the ground and is three or four inches tall or whatever, and a good stand. But say for instance, he went out there it's full of weeds, it's full of grass. The loss of justice may report back and say, well, look, I, I saw a few plants out there, a few stands out there, but I, but if more weeds and grass overcome the crop than anything, that could be a scenario where the county committee could may ask the producer for more information before they approve or disapprove that notice of loss. I've had situations that went all the way through appeals where the producer sweared out that he planted X amount of crops per so many seed per feet and so many plants per feet. But when it came down to the appeal process and the administrative judge asked them to provide records on what they bought, when they bought it and where they bought it, they couldn't provide that information. So therefore, their decision was upheld. 
So I, I tell producers, and, and I do a lot of these, and I, I'm not proud of that because we, we deal with a lot of fraud situations, and I deal with a lot of truth situations that producers have, have gained relief, and it wasn't their fault. But I've also dealt with a lot of fraud situations, too. Now, in most situations like that, the only way in this scenario that I don't see him denied, now, him not getting the payment not necessarily mean that he was denied. Him not getting the payment could have just been that his yield, he didn't meet that threshold. So him not getting the payment does not mean that it was ineligible. It just means that he didn't qualify a payment because of his yield didn't meet his tre the threshold and he couldn't have really got a payment. Most situations like this, the only way that it totally would be denied is if he, like I told you about that 72 hour window, if he didn't report it timely, that would be grounds for um, not approved. If it's not a timely notice of law, um, he not, did not report it timely. Um, good farming practices basically mean that they planted a crop out there and they abandoned it, never went out there. I had a situation where the guy admitted that the farm admitted that he sent his work out there to plant it and he ain't been out there to look at the crop till two weeks later. So therefore him as a producer, he's the one that's liable for that, not the, not the, the worker. You can't just go off and want the worker. So you mean tell me you planted the crop two weeks ago and you never went out there to see if it was planted or how much was planted? And the farmer admitted that when we was in the trial. I couldn't believe it, but he admitted it. But it's different scenarios. But in this case, if it was an eligible cause of loss, like in this, if it was flooded, then that's excessive moisture. That is an eligible cause of loss. Now, where you're looking at is, is where the denial of the application of payment would be. They denied the application of payment because he didn't follow good farming practice. Or he did abandonment of the crop. Or things of that nature would cause the application of payment for, to be denied. But it would be an eligible cause of loss, but its application of payment could be denied. And then again, like I said before, it is an appealable situation in there. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Our last uh, scenario, um, farmer Cindy has buy up nap coverage for her two acres of blueberries. It's been a very wet summer and many of her bushes are impacted by root rot. She notifies her FSA office that there is a disease outbreak in her blueberries the office inf informs her that NAP doesn't cover disease outbreaks. Um, why did the office tell her that the loss wasn't covered? And uh, bonus question, would a NAP payment cover the cost of replace replacement of blueberry bushes? Okay. The, the answer to the first part of the question is, number one, bear in mind, NAP only covers production, which is the fruit itself. It doesn't cover the vines. It doesn't cover the bushes. So it does, it did, it only covered the production. Now, if she came into the office and said, because of excessive moisture, then my crop developed disease, then disease by itself is not the eligible cause of loss. Disease has to be tied with an eligible rather eligible, I'm sorry, let me get my words coming back here now. Eligible weather event caused the disease. So if it was excessive moisture, and call rot in them, then that then that's an eligible cause of loss. If it was excessive heat and and it caused drought, and then it caused nematodes or or, or something to get into it, that which caused another disease, then that was an eligible loss. But if they report to the office just disease, then disease by itself is not an eligible cause of loss. Now, as far as the last percent. Would a NAP payment cover the cost of replacement blueberry bushes? Now, again, NAP payment is only going to cover the production. Now, we do have another program called the TAP program, which stands for Tree Assistance Program. And that's another program that I'm in charge of is that's a program that's a, we call it ad hoc, which basically means it's available at any time. It's no cost to the producer. Basically, that is a program that covers the bushes and the vines because of an eligible disaster. Now it has to be a disaster, an eligible disaster that took place to cause that. So if a hurricane came through and it broke them and it and it broke up the, the, the vines, it bend them over. In the TAP program, what it does, 
it either going to pay replacement costs or it's either going to pay rehabilitation costs, which rehabilitation costs is it paid for having to have bushes stood back up and put stakes in to help them stand up. All of these losses would tap on, on a tap loss adjustment, which most of the time is the same nap loss adjustment, will come out and adjust it for tap losses as well. So FSA, Farm Service Agency, does have benefit to help replacement of bushes and trees as well. But NAP only covers production, not the, not the bushes or trees. Great, those were all of our scenarios. Um, now there's opportunity for, uh, if there are more questions, um, either throw them in the chat or if you wanna come off mute, that's okay. Uh, and also stop sharing so we can stop looking at slides this whole time. Uh, have any other questions come in, Sabine? Not in the chat, I was gonna give people a second, but um, if people do have questions, you can put them in the chat or you can just come off mute. But um, in the meantime, if people are trying to decide if it makes sense for them to get NAP for their farm, what kind of information would go into that um, decision? Can you talk a little bit about as, as people are thinking this through? Well, I think one thing you need to look at is your number of acres. Um, see if it's benefit as far as the number of acres of the crop you're trying to grow. And based on looking at what your input costs are, if you know what your input costs are and you want to look at budgets and different things and scenario, then that always plays into fact whether or not you want to, you can risk not having insurance. You know, I was a, I, I used to raise a lot of cotton and did peanuts. Really, it didn't, it was a no brainer for me, not only from a lending side that I had to carry insurance, but I knew for a fact that it's no way in the world I'm gonna put 600 acres of cotton in the ground and I'm not gonna cover. So that was a no brainer when I knew what my input costs were. So I think you need to really look at on the whole what your input costs are, um, what you got tied up in it. You know, not only input costs, your personal label, your personal time into this, your management decisions into this. And then to just go to your local office. I mean, contact, you may can't go into, depending on what state you're in, just like with us you can, in North Carolina, you can't go into that office, but you can call that local office and there's people there that can help you answer the question that you need. If they can't answer those questions at the office, they're gonna call me and I'm gonna get an answer for them. So either one way or the other, the local office is gonna get that answer for you. Then if you never have been into that local office, now is the time to go in on a call and establish and get that line of communication going. Especially if you're in North Carolina, tell them you've been on a webinar and James Davis was on this webinar. Everybody in the state of North Carolina gonna know who James Davis is. Then they gonna know that you got information from me. Then they gonna know that they need to do what they need to do. You know, so I mean, and I just want to take the opportunity to say this too now. I'm the NAP specialist me personally, but under my division, if you got anybody that deals with out there that not only with NAP, ARC and PLC program, our dairy marketing program, our um, marketing assistant loans and loss deficiency program all falls up under my division that I'm responsible for, that I supervise that information. So any of these other scenario situations that you have, um, Please feel free to let the people know at RAF and they know I get in touch with them and we get those things answered. Go ahead. Any other questions? Um, I don't see any that came in. Nikki or Lisa, do you have any follow-up questions? Nothing on my end. Um, Not for me. We're going to send out, um, along with the recording, we'll send out kind of a list of um, documents or like information that people that you might need to have um, in order to apply for NAP. But James, if you could just go over quickly, if someone is getting ready to go into their FSA office, how would they best prepare? What do they need to bring in so that they have the information that, the, that they would be asking them and so that they could actually apply for NAP coverage when they go in there? First, if, if you don't have if you don't have a farm and track number established, 
the first thing you need to do is ask your local office, listen, I, I'm, I'm a new farmer or you've been farming. It's a lot of people that's been farming and don't have a farm or track number. But what you can do is say, listen, I got information on farm service agent. I know y'all deal with farm and track numbers. I want to get a farm and track number established. Let me know what I need. So then they probably gonna say, well, are you the owner or are you planning on renting the land? So therefore, are you if you are a landowner, then what they're gonna ask is to bring in your deed of the property that you own. And what they can do, we have GIS equipment that can go in and zoom down to your parcel of land and we can draw out a map. Because a lot of times we we don't have a lot of people that may not have a large space. A person might have an area in the back of their house and they've been, they've been cutting the grass on why they want to turn it into a, a tillable space. But they own that whole track. So they bring in that track and what they do, GIS will go in and they're going to ask you, they'll bring you around and look at the computer and they'll say, well, where you want it at? And you say, I've been growing it right here. And what it's going to do, they're going to draw that out. They're going to put it into a map and the acreage is going to be um, the acreage is going to be shown up on that as well. So then, therefore, that's going to be your map. Then from that, after that, you get that established. Then you're going to say, as far as NAP go, say, look, I'm interested in the NAP program. Tell me, tell you can either start off by saying the crops that you're raising, or even you can just start off saying, well, tell me, I would like to get a list of the crops that y'all cover in your state for NAP insurance. Then from there, once you look at that, then you can determine whether or not you need to take out coverage on that. Because it could be a crop that you don't raise that's not on there. So then if it's a crop that you don't see, then you can pose a question to say then, well, how could I possibly get this on my crop? Now, the thing too, some of the crops, and I failed to mention this, some of the crops, that's if it's on the North Carolina list, it means it's grown in North Carolina, but it could not be grown in your specific county. So therefore, if they say, well, it's not, it's on this list, but it's not in the county, how can I get that on your county? So what they do then is they'll make a request to me and they'll say that, look, I got a producer that's growing this. Um, can you add that crop to our county? And yeah, and I can go in and then I can add that crop to that county. So go in and build those relationships. And um, and it's all about relationships. I used to, before I, when I came on started from, I used to just go by the farm service days off and ask questions because I didn't know. And the only way I got familiar with all their programs is I went in and just asked questions to find out more. Any literature and brochures that I could get from them, I got from them. You know, my dad and granddaddy farm but they never did a lot of, they, my dad went into the local office to certify his crop on that 578. But as far as other in additional program, they never took advantage of it because they, they didn't necessarily know the program. You know, a lot of times, you know, when we're looking at outreach, a person may not outreach the way someone may think they need to outreach. But I've learned over time is outreach evolves it's a two-way street number one you got to establish that dialogue and build those relationships and that's what i have done over the years not only when i was in the local office as the director i built those relationships i used to be in my office and i would hear producers come in and they get to talking and some of my program technicians they may not have knew what they were talking about but i always made sure i got up and stopped what i was doing to go out and build that relationship and that rapport with that producer and find out more what they're talking about. Well, tell me more about this. How long you been growing this? You know, do you think it's some beneficial to you and is it beneficial to others? It's about building that dialogue and building that rapport. So I know we're at times there that we can't do that face to face, face to face, just like we're doing these calls now. But we got the mechanism now still to outreach to get the people the information they need. So go into those local offices and please build those relationships. Great, thank you. And yeah, like I said, we'll, we, um, if no one was taking notes on all those things, we'll take, um, we'll make a list of those things and send this out with it. So you'll have those handy. Um, are there any other questions 
um, you, you can either come off mute or put them in the chat. And otherwise I think I'll hand it over to Lisa. There's the mute button. Yeah. Um, yeah, if there are other questions, I think we'll wrap up um, and I just will um, summarize and remind what all the resources that you'll be receiving uh, probably by early next week. Um, then you uh, a recording of the webinar um, as well as a PDF of the slides if it's useful to reference back to those um, and try to do a summary of some of the, the specific Q and A's that were answered. Um, and then we'll also be sending an email for a, an evaluation of the webinar. Um, if you can take a couple minutes just to complete that, that's very helpful for our work and to make sure that we can um, continue to provide useful webinars for you all. Um, and as a reminder of ways that Rafi can help moving forward from this webinar, feel free to reach out to us for any other additional like one-on-one -on -one technical assistance um, or if there are particular questions with your operation that would be useful um, to go through. We have um, an email, phone, or an intake form. I had that information on the first slide, but it'll also be in that, um, that follow-up email of ways that you can get in touch with us. Um, you, know, you now know that James is the, you know, the NAP expert for North Carolina. There's one in each state. So if you're in a state other than North Carolina and need help getting in touch with that NAP expert, you can also reach out to us for that. Um, we have flyers and some other materials on NAP and other FSA program flyers on our website. There'll be a link to that in our email that you're welcome to, to look at and you know, distribute to others who might be interested. And we hope to have more webinars coming up um, this spring on different FSA programs, thinking about disaster relief, thinking about building relationships with your FSA office. Um, so be on the lookout for those as well. And with that, I think we'll close for the evening. Um, thank you all for coming. And yeah, look out for an email from us soon. Thank you all, Lisa. Yes, thank you for being here. Uh-huh.